you're listening to Serial Killers, Mass Murderers, and Other Macabre Stories with Michael Cashy and Stacey Sturm. Good morning, I'm Stacey Sturm. I'm Michael Cashy. How's it going today, Cashy? Oh, another day. Another day. It's a good day for murder today. It's always a good day for murder. <laughs> Today, we are going to the state to the west of us, a state that I Idaho. call home. Uh, Minnesota. That's East. New Hampshire. East. Pennsylvania. Somebody was just criticizing on TikTok the fact that Americans have no geography history, like <laughs> knowledge at all. It's pretty bad. Not only of our, of our country, but any country. Well, our country is tough because it's 50 states, which uh, Europe is like 50 countries or yeah. pretty close, so... It's true, but people have no clue, like, yeah. you know, you'd think, especially when you get to be like, I don't know, like 40 years old or so, you'd kind of know where the states are at. I and People will still point to the map and be like, I don't know, that's either Kansas or Iowa or something like that. Arkansas, maybe. I don't know. Like, it's actually Manitoba. It's actually California. But yeah, so anyway, we digress. Um, welcome to Serial Killers, Mass Murderers, and Other Macabre Stories today. We go to my homeland of Montana. You're from Montana? I am. <clears throat> Where the women are safe and the sheep are scared. That joke never got old. That's the first thing I heard when I moved to North Dakota. Oh, I've literally... I'm like, really? North Dakota's going to criticize? We don't have many sheep. <laughs> no, I mean, just it's in cow. general. It's cows. I'm like, hey, at least we're known for something. I had to ask when we moved to North Dakota, like, what, what is it? And it's literally the state next to us. Well, there you go. That's enough. I'm like, what is it? They're like, oh, it's going to Everyone's like, oh, you got the Black Hills? Nope. That's nah, South Dakota. Oh, you got the Presidents? No, nope, that's, that's South, South Dakota. South Dakota. They can keep that. Oh, you got uh, the skiing, Big Sky. No, that's Montana. We do have the Badlands. For like... 10 miles. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Still got it. But yeah, so today we are talking about one of Montana's most nefarious serial killers, David. I believe I say, I'm saying this right, Mirhofer. So now. David Mirhofer. I have to ask since you're from a small state. Yes. Did you know anyone in it? No. No. Every, every time, like, oh, from North he Dakota. Only had... Do you know? Are you from, do you know? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, no, no you, I don't know anybody. You you realize there's more than five people here, right? <laughs> Ironically, though, I will go. It doesn't matter. I'll go. We'll go. We could go to like Florida and see somebody in the airport. That's like, oh, do you know so and so? Yeah, I do. North Dakota is actually way smaller feeling than Montana is. Montana does not have that. Yeah, probably because you've been here longer. No, uh, it could be. Yeah, that could you've be lived that, here so. longer than you lived in Montana. Yeah, maybe. In, Mon- in Montana. Yeah. I don't know. It's North Dakota is extremely... Montana is very small because uh, the, the towns aren't very big. I think the biggest town in Montana is either oh, Missoula or Billings. And they're both the size of Bismarck, if not smaller. So it's n- it's not a very large state. It's very sped out and... Billings is 109,000. Yeah. Missoula is 74,000. Yeah, so they're both about, if not smaller, than Bismarck. And I believe those are the biggest cities in Montana. It's So it's roughly the same. It kind of is. Size, because yeah. I'm sure Fargo is not much bigger. Fargo, they say, is 200,000 people. But is it? that's transient people. Do you know what I mean? Like college? Like a lot of those kids don't live there four months. 125,000. For Fargo, that's for Fargo. it. Oh. So well, it's then not, technically, it's I feel like Bismarck's probably bigger than Fargo. No, the, that's Bismarck prob- Mandan is probably bigger than that's Fargo because they have about ninety thousand, tw- about twenty five or thirty thousand of the residents though are college kids that are going to go I, back to their I, homeland for the summer. Probably not because they're not residents of Fargo, so they're not included in the population. No, well, maybe because then we would have to include Moorhead if you're going to include Mandan. That's true. Yeah. All right. I'll give them that. But anyway. So today, we are talking about David Mirhofer. And I remember hearing about the story a little bit when I was a kid, but not a lot. I have heard more about him, like, recently than I did when I actually lived in the state of Montana. 
So um, we're just going to get right into the story here. Uh, David Meerhofer was born June 8th, 1949 in Bozeman, Montana. Mm. Uh, one of Clifford and Eleanor Meerhofer's five children. Shortly after his birth, they moved to a small town of Manhattan. Manhattan, Montana. Obviously. Yeah. Just checking to make sure. Just in case. One, you said small town. And two, I was assuming they never left the state. Yes. Um, David would spend his childhood and adolescence there in Manhattan. He attended the local school, Manhattan High School, due to his melancholic temperament is what they... He was very broody and Uh, introverted. Little emo kid. He was very much an emo kid. He was considered an outcast and bullied by other students quite a bit. He graduated in 1967. He worked several odd jobs before being drafted into the Army in the fall of 1968. He enlisted in the Marine Corps in October 1st, spending the next few months at a military base in San Diego as part of the Signal Corps. I don't know. I wasn't in the Marines. No, but I figure you might know know things about it. I know how to read. (laughs) Oh. After completing his basic training, he was sent to Cherry Point before being dispatched to fight in the Vietnam War in 1969. Well, this story's already shaping up to be yeah. interesting. Serving in the 5th Communications Battalion. For his achievements in deploying communication systems and controlling military formations during armed assaults, he was awarded the National Defense Service Medal, the Vietnam Service Medal, and the Vietnam Campaign Medal. In August 1971, he returned to the United States where he continued his military service in Ca- at Camp Pendleton. And then in 1973, he was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps and he returned to Manhattan. There he supported himself as a semi-self-employed handyman, carpenter, kind of ran a fix-it shop in the small town of Manhattan. For people that don't know, Manhattan is... It's it's uh, maybe 1,500, 2,000 people. Okay. And it's about 30 minutes away from Bozeman. And, um, you know, I feel like um, being a handyman yeah. is like the perfect cover for a serial killer. You got all the tools. Well, and two, and you're people, self-employed. people you get are access just access to gonna, people's houses. They're going to invite one. Usually it's going to be, especially back then. The calls would probably be during the day while husband was at work. Yeah. Wife's alone. Yeah. Oh, stabby stab. I'm surprised there aren't more handyman serial killers, though. The, I mean, there really are. You know what? They're probably too busy working, I guess. They, have, they probably would so be. They're so backed up on projects. They probably, they probably would be, but they're just too busy. <laughs> well, and like, it's... I really want to kill today, but... It is a perfect cover, but not. Like, the wife is will tell her husband, like, hey, Joe, the handyman is coming over, and he's going to finish up that whatever project. So if wife yes. goes missing, you kind of know where to find her. But... Kind of know who the last person was to see her. They can, uh, can, like, get stuff ready. Like, I don't know, mess with the lock on the door. Oh. Or something like that. Set the trap. Yeah. Gotcha. But, once again, probably too backed up. Yeah, they have too many projects going on. So Mirhofer first came under the police's radar following the kidnapping of seven-year-old Susan Jagger. The girl had been abducted from a tent in the middle of the night on June 25th, 1973, while camping with her family in Missouri Headwaters State Park. How do you get abducted from a tent? Uh, everyone's sleeping, and I guess if you're quiet... if Have you ever tried opening a tent quietly? Yeah. It doesn't work. You're going to have to be fast, because... By the time they hear the tent, they're going to be startled. You're going to have to quick cover their mouth so you don't hear them. But you hear about that quite a bit. Good God. There's a lot of kids that back in the 70s, this is why I don't like camping. Still to this day, I'm not a camper. I heard about too many children being abducted from their tents while they were camping in a state park. So when my family would say, hey, we're going to go camp in Makoshika today, I'm like, no. Jesus. I knew I was going to die for sure just because you just heard of so many kids I, I don't. getting abducted from tents back in the 70s and 80s. Unless they're, they're sleeping 30, 40 feet off. Well, maybe. I mean, and they might takes, not be all right next to each other. It just takes one scream. Uh, it just takes one. But that's why I said you got to hurry up, cover their tape or cover their mouth or something right away. Th- that's impressive, actually. Yeah. Because I can't even get into a tent. You know what, though? I have to say, like, kids don't wake up quick. 
adults do, kids don't startle easy. They don't wake up quick. You have to shake the hell out of a child in the middle of the night yeah. to get them up sometimes. It's, they don't wake up like we do because I, maybe they don't have the life experience of knowing that if, some, if they hear something in the middle of the night, they need to startle up. I don't know why. I just figured there's but a just knowing, reaction. No, just knowing having kids to try to wake a child up at 2 or 3 in the morning. I am not a is, professional child haver, so <laughs> I, I, I don't know how children I'm operate. a semi-pro. I was not very good at it. Oh. But, yeah. You brought them to adulthood. I did, and I feel like they're decent humans. They haven't been kidnapped out of tents. No, they were not because we never took them camping at a state park. But anyway, uh, so the girl had been abducted from a tent in the middle of the night, June 25th, 1973, while camping at Missouri Headwaters State Park. Three days later, a man called one of the FBI's regional offices in Denver, Colorado, claiming he'd kidnapped her and demanded $25,000 in ransom. On June 2nd, now this is before, this is the 70s, man. They didn't trace calls like they did now and... You know. 12 minutes. Keep him on the line. Keep him on the line. <laughs> ten just another Keep ten him minutes. on the line. <laughs> on July 2nd, the Gallatin County Sheriff's Department Deputy Ron Brown received a similar call. This time, the kidnapper demanded $50,000. And to back up his claims, he described Jagger's appearance, pointing out that she had a unique fingernail on one index finger, which was later confirmed by her parents. Ah, yes. The old unique fingernail. <laughs> what does that mean? It must have like a half gone or a chip out of it, or it's got like a, a blood spot on it or something like that. So like a kid's fingernail. No. I know. Kids, I mean, kids' nails are sometimes scruffy, but they're not like, there obviously was something odd about the fingernail. Hmm. Initially, police agreed to transfer the ransom in a veiled attempt to catch the perp. But this was unsuccessful, as nobody came to the drop-off. On September 24th, the kidnapper called the Jager family home and talked to Susan's older brother, 16-year-old Daniel, referring to his previous calls to the sheriff and the FBI to prove that it was him. By that time, in order to record the conversation, the family's house had been wiretapped, resulting in a successful recording of the full conversation. So... Now, this dude's dre- greedy. He's, like, wanting to talk to everybody, apparently. He's just wanting to tell everybody about this kidnapping. Well, I can't imagine how he ever got caught. <laughs> well, the crazy thing is, we'll get to that. He didn't, really. After examining it, the FBI managed to trace the caller to a filling station in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Ah, I've been there. Yeah. Despite this revelation, they were unable to apprehend a suspect and the case remained dormant for several months. Then in February of 1974, approximately 1,200 skeletal fragments were found at the Lockhart Place, an abandoned ranch in Three Forks, Montana. Geography lesson, Three Forks, Montana is also about 30 minutes away from Bozeman in another direction. So it's about 30 minutes away from where he grew up. So Three Forks is also in Gallatin County, uh, kind of close to Bozeman. Following a forensic examination, it was determined the fragments belonged to two separate victims. The first was a girl aged six to eight, while the other was a woman aged 18 to 20. Four months later, on June 25th, the kidnapper called the Jagers again. For approximately an hour, he (laughs) talked with the girl's mother, Marietta, during which he reaffirmed that it was him by describing Susan's appearance and the previous phone calls, ending the conversation by saying that he was unable to return her. So he had this whole hour long conversation, didn't ask for money, didn't, but then was like, sorry, I can't bring her back. What what the hell is he talking about the whole time? I have no clue. (laughs) So how was your day? Are you watching any new shows? (laughs) You catch the game last night? (laughs) A few days later, authorities were contacted by a Three Forks resident named Ralph Green. Green reported an invoice for a phone call made on June 25th, which he did not make. While investigating his telephone cables, police found a voice gateway and other devices that were built into a line break. (laughs) Nice. Back Back in the day. Right? Which they suspected, and I guess keep in mind, he was a communications guy. Mm Mm-hmm which they suspected that Susan Jager's kidnapper had used to make the call. After this information, several profilers from the FBI who had been working on refining a brand new technique in profiling made a psychological profile of the the supposed offender. So So he was the first serial killer to be, to use the profiling method on. 
So he was the very first person that the FBI used the huh. profiler method on. So offender profiling is now a contemporary method used to discover clues pertaining to characteristics of an unknown offender from evidence at a scene of the crime and to psychologically profile the perp. But he was the very first person that they actually used it on to come up with a profile. I want how accurate was their profile? Pretty spot on. By their estimations, the subject was a white man, 25 to 35, um, likely local to the area with a background in the telecommunications industry or the military, given what he spliced the line with and given what they saw, and a known social outcast who had problems interacting with others ever since he was a child. Nailed it. Yeah, I'd hate to hear my profile. <laughs> I could profile you. I could tell you exactly what you're like. You couldn't because you know me. I know. In the course of the investigation, police considered several suspects, but gradually narrowed on Mirhofer as the most likely culprit. Police noted that a man matching his description had made frequent trips to Three Forks between 1973 and 1974, where he carried out construction and installation work at various ranches, including the Lockhart Place, where they found all of those remains. Ooh. After checking his travel schedule, they also successfully placed him in Wyoming in September of 1973, after finding a receipt from an auto repair shop in Cheyenne, on the day, September 24th, that the call to the Jager family was made. So if you're going to make a call about a murdered or kidnapped child, you probably shouldn't take your car in for repairs. Holy God. To a very near and near close gas station that day. Based on this evidence, Mirhofer was arrested in August of 1974 and brought to the police station for interrogation. However, he claimed that he was not responsible for Jager's abduction. In an attempt to prove his innocence, he agreed to be interrogated under the influence of sodium pentothal, otherwise known as pentothal. Pentothal, sorry, otherwise known as truth truth, serum. Truth serum, yeah. Good time. Yeah. He also. Have you taken it? No. (laughs) I'm like. I don't. I don't even. I don't even want to know what kind of army shit you had to take truth serum for. I don't think that they do it because I. I don't know how accurate it is. Uh, is it just it slows your responses down so long that if you're lying, like your brain can't gotcha um, can't come up with it. But I'm sure once again, there's ways around it. Or yeah, um, he also took a polygraph, which results proved inconclusive. Shocker. And I know your feelings on polygraph testing. Yeah, it's it's in, they're so inaccurate. Uh, yeah, people can trick them if they know how to trick their body. They can trick them. Yeah, but the lie detector. Once again, if you're too nervous, yeah. you're not going to get results. Exactly, and it doesn't take into account like just well, like it, I think aut- like people on the spectrum tend to fail of even if they're telling the truth, just because of how their body reacts to stuff. Right. Yeah. Because they lacked any solid evidence to arrest him, the authorities ultimately released him without any charges. The audio recordings from his interrogation were later shown to the. Uh, to the parents of Susan Jager, who talked to this dude for hours and hours on end. Yeah. Um, so that was shown to her parents, and they identified him as the caller. During September of that year, Marietta confronted Mirhofer several times, accusing him of killing her daughter Ooh. and urging him to confess. He stuck around. Yeah, he stuck that around. Is he didn't stupid. flee. That's a, that's a bold move. Um, after one such meeting on September 24th, the kidnapper presenting himself as Travis called the family again, angrily declaring that they would never see their daughter alive again due to their cooperation with the police. During the phone call, Marietta referred to Mirhofer by his name, to which he did not respond. It's Travis. Unbeknownst to him, the FBI had been monitoring the call and had an uh, audio phono- phonoscopic, audio phonos- audio phonoscopic um, examination. Basically, they tried to match audio. Yeah conclusively determined that he indeed was the caller arresting him on the very next day. While Mirhofer was detained at the Gallatin County Jail in Bozeman, authorities began a search of his house in the interior of his car. Searchers found bloodied women's clothing, washed out bloodstains, and a human hand and several (laughs) fingers, the latter of which he kept in the refrigerator. Well, as one does. You don't want that to spoil. That was part of his profile, though, too. Uh, I, did, I didn't put it in here, and I thought I did, but part of the profile was they said the killer will keep 
body so, parts or souvenirs from his victims. I get that the urge might be there, but if you want to continue to get away with this, don't. Don't they say the most serial killers mess up on purpose? Because they want to get caught. I think that's at the end because they're usually very careful. Yeah. Until the breakdown. Like Ted Bundy was extremely careful until, well, like the second time he got caught and then he decided to kill an entire sorority house. Yeah. And went off the deep end. Upon learning of these findings on September 29th, Mirhofer confessed to two crimes. He admitted to abducting and killing Susan Jager, as well as 19-year-old Sandra Dykeman of Smalligan, who had gone missing on February 10th of that year from a basketball game in Manhattan, Montana. During the interrogation, Mirhofer admitted that he had attempted to establish an intimate relationship with her, but she had refused, and he abducted her, tied her, and gagged her, and she suffocated to death. So he didn't mean... His intent was to rape her. Yeah. And that didn't work out because he gagged her and she couldn't breathe. And so she suffocated to death. In regard to Jager, he claimed that he had stabbed the girl to death shortly after kidnapping her as she resisted fiercely. His motive for the murder was never determined as so Mirhofer. he still, like that wasn't just an accident. He started stabbing her. Well, she resisted. But he said she suffocated. No, that's the other girl. Oh, okay. 19 year old. Okay. okay, sorry. That was the 19-year-old girl that he kidnapped from a basketball game gotcha. okay. and put in a trunk, gagged her and put her in a trunk to rape later, and then she died when he gagged her. Okay. Susan is the little girl he took from the gotcha. tent. Um, yeah, so his motive for the murder was never determined as he vehemently denied that his aim was to rape her, like little Susan, not the other girl. After killing his victims, he dismembered the bodies with a hunting knife and a wood saw and then burned them in a fire pit before finally scattering their ashes and remaining bones at the Lockhart place. In an attempt to avoid capital punishment, his defense attorney brokered a plea deal involving the confession of two other murders that had not been linked to him before. Okay. So they basically were like, listen, we won't give you the death penalty because Montana still had the death penalty then. Mm -hmm. We won't give you the death penalty if you tell us if you murdered these boys one was the death of 13 year old bernard polman shot to death on a bridge in three forks in march 19th of 1967 so this was way early Holy while crap. swimming with a friend police had initially ascribed the polman incident as an accidental shooting or a ricochet from hunters or target shooters the second additional murder was that of a 12-year-old Boy Scout, Michael Rainey, who had been beaten to death in Three Forks during an outdoor practice session. While a, and I don't know what the practice session was, so don't know. I don't know. Hmm. While a definitive motive for those murders was never established either, Mirhofer himself claimed that before killing Rainey, he wanted to get a little kid. Interrogators suspected he may have committed more than those four, but only confessed to those because that was the plea deal that they had with county prosecutors. So they said there is other murders in that area huh. between like 1965 and when he was caught, but they only asked him about those two boys. So that's all he confessed to. Some of the Montana crimes. I wonder how they initially thought the one was an accident, like a hunting accident, and then they linked him to to it because that just that seems like a big jump i think they were just throwing it out there i think they were like these are two more unsolved murders and around the three forks area let's see if he well, did one it. of them they didn't even think was a murder i know well but they were unsure about it so i suppose they're like let's just see if he did it some of the montana crimes though that he was that Mirhofer was suspected of committing were later attributed to wayne nance who I've heard of, too. He was another serial killer that was active in Montana in the late 70s and early 80s. He was a long and also long haul trucker Richard William Davis, who was posthumously linked by DNA to a 1974 murder of a five year old girl in Missoula, Montana. Is that the Santa Claus guy, William Richard Davis? Yes. Uh, Richard, Richard William Davis. He's a long haul trucker from Montana. Richard William? Yeah, Richard William Davis. Who was nope. who was linked to a the murder of a five year old girl in Missoula, Montana? Okay. Four hours after giving his confession, Mirhofer was found dead in his jail cell. Though he hanged himself with a towel, jailers had not been informed he was a murder suspect, so he was not put on suicide watch. So as soon as he confessed to these things, 
which is ironic because he confessed to them to avoid capital punishment. Yeah, this is his screw you. I guess. The cases associated with Miroffer were closed, but his reasoning and motivations for the murders still remain unclear to this day because he, his, he never went to trial. He never made it to trial or anything past that initial investigation that they did after they arrested him um, and had him confess. Go with little uh, Agent Orange, yeah. little uh, well, psychopathy. Oh, but they anyways. said he was always kind of a mess. He was a well, messed yeah. up kid. Yeah, but... And get a load of this. His younger brother is also like a career criminal. Let's see. Where oh. did I find that? Alan, Alan Mirhofer was arrested in 86 for a string of child rapes near Seattle, Holy Washington. Holy crap. Alan has never spoke to journalists, though, or police about possible connections between his and David's crimes. But yeah, he was arrested in 1986 for a bunch of child rapes well, near Seattle, like, Washington. Sounds like so, he had a terrible home life, most likely. Yeah, so I don't, so I don't think you can totally blame it on the military because it seems like you, whole family's kind of messed up. So there you go. That is the happy story <laughs> of David Mirhofer of Three Forks, Montana. Very interesting. Damn, people like now, like, oh, the world's going to hell. Blah blah blah. I'm like, um, do you remember the seventies? Oh, it was so easy for people to get away with. Well, look because at all the serial killers we had did, active then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the 90s were actually the most deadly decade. Like, crime has actually been going down since the 90s. Yeah. The 90s was the, the peak of murder and death. I wonder why the 70s and 80s had so many serial killers. Did they, do they, did they really have more than we have now? I think so. Um I mean, I, just this last month, our number of mass murderers grew exponentially. Well, school shootings is a little different. Um, it's still mass murders, you know. <clears throat> I don't know. I'd be curious to run the numbers of how many serial killers and, and mass murderers were per decade. We have much better profiling now, and we're, we're still not. They get caught right away now. Yeah. That's, I think maybe we just don't hear about it as much because they get caught right away now. There's not this whole big hunt. There's not a hunt for these people anymore because well, everybody knows where they're is a at. Big thing. Yeah, cameras everywhere, so everyone getting upset about that. Just remember, it's probably saved a lot of lives. That's valid. Yeah, I don't know. That's sad. That's um, the area he grew up is. I'd say some of the prettiest country that I've ever seen, the Gallatin Valley. I think That's that actually the start of the Missouri River, for those that don't know. The Missouri River actually starts. It's three rivers. It's Jefferson, Madison, and something else all converge to form the Missouri River. I feel like we used the to go up, up there camping a lot. And you're still alive? <laughs> wasn't the 70s. It would have been uh, the 90s. It probably, I was going to say, probably wouldn't have even been the 80s because you were just a baby it was the in 90s. 1987. So. It was the deadliest decade. I'm super lucky. Uh, people weren't getting taken out of tents in the 90s, though. Yeah. That was already done. That probably, was a done deal. Probably just getting shot. All the state park tent murders were at their, at their peak in the 70s and 80s. So you were safe. You're probably safe to go there. But yeah, it's really, it's really pretty country, that big sky country. Yeah. It's nice. Also, oh. though, a lot of trees, a lot of places to hide bodies. Yeah. So, and bears. Bears, yeah. Yeah, I remember last time we were in... Oh, last time we were in Big Sky. I remember waking up, and I heard, I heard a ruckus. I heard a ruckus in a racket. And I looked outside of our window, and there was like a bear. No. Just looking back in, like, hey, what up? Just want your garbage. Uh, uh, people, if you are ever traveling to a, you know, national park and you see a bear or a uh, buffalo, um, don't approach it. Yeah, we know from these parts dealing with wild animals, but we've seen way too many people think they're going to approach a bison, apparently, and, or a buffalo and, like, pet it. I don't know what they think they're going to do with it. I think that maybe they just want to get closer to take pictures. Just take the picture. Use don't your Zoom. That. Yeah. Use your Zoom. Don't do Yeah. It's not good. I think the closest I've ever been to a uh, buffalo has probably been maybe 20 feet away. That's pretty close. It's very close. But it was at, it was at Roosevelt. It was at Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And they were outside of the... I had to pee. They were mm. outside of the rest area. Like, I'd, 
I was I waited to see, but it was just laying there. It wasn't going to get up and yeah. move. And I'm like, I got to pee. So I'm sorry. So I didn't approach it. I think the, de- the deal is you can go around around Keep your them. distance. Don't Keep your distance. Don't approach it. It's going to see if you start to approach it, it's going to see you as a threat. If I'm walking away from it, it's not going to probably attack me. When winter I'm not an expert in bison by any means or buffalo, but I, I do know this. When, you don't do that. Went winter camping in uh, the Badlands one year mm-hmm. and uh, sun was like coming down. So like, we got to find a spot to set up set our tent up because it's going to get cold fast. Yeah. And uh, we just see this mountain lion go just <laughs> bolting across. We're mm, like, oh, this is dinner. great. And then we see like a buffalo kind of, just one lone buffalo kind of like running towards it. So I'm like, all right, this might be a good spot. <laughs> 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 we don't have the time. And if that thing comes back, like the, if the buffalo sticks around. Yeah. Then... Usually they, they don't want to go around people. Some of the, some of the buffalo though around like Teddy Roosevelt National Park, they're so used to people that they just don't care. They just lay on the road. They yeah. lay on the side of the road. Yeah, and you have to go around they just them. Do what they want. Yeah. Same thing. If you're down in South Dakota, I used to visit um, the Black Hills. Pretty much every summer when I was a kid, we would go to the Black Hills, and same thing. They they'll just like they'll just walk right by your car. They'll look in at you and be like, "What up." And just keep walking. Yeah, but don't make any sudden movements. Don't yeah, do yell. not do not do not roll your window down. Do not try to feed it. Yeah, dumb people. So there you go. So you've you've got tips to stay alive while camping, uh, tips on how not to interact with wild animals, and also a uh, maybe sleep in the same tent as your today. as your children if you're going. Yeah, if you that's do. a good idea. Not a, not because the classics idea. are coming back. And glamping is not camping. If you're going to the river every week with your giant RV, you're not camping. <laughs> well, I mean, technically, they kind of are. They're not. Because they're not near services. Like, they don't have, I guess. They, they have running water. Uh, they have air conditioning. Yeah. I think most people don't go there to rough it, though. They, they, they consider it camping because they're staying overnight. Like, out in not their house. Well, then you know what? Because people consider camping in their backyard, too. Super 8 Motel is freaking camping, then. Honestly, it's more hardcore than going in your camper. Well, some of them are, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. If there's a story you think we should cover, this was one that was sent to me uh, from somebody. One of our people sent me that. And so that's why I... One of our three fans. One of our three fans. You guys are the best. We love you very much. So if you have a story you think we should cover, uh, something that is interesting, definitely send it to us. You can message us through our Facebook page, or you can also email me, Stacy at URLradio.net. Thanks for listening to our killer podcast, Serial Killers, Mass Murderers, and Other Macabre Stories, with Michael Cashy and Stacy Sturm. Let us know if there's a story you think we should talk about. You can find our page on Facebook or email us at Stacy at urlradio.net. Stay safe.